Hello, I'm Elliot Margulies. The Mid-Peninsula Community Media Center brings you this discussion with Santa Clara County Supervisor and former Mayor of Palo Alto, Liz Niss. Supervisor Niss just wrapped up a year as President of the Board of Supervisors, and in a moment, we'll talk about the high points and low points during her term, and I guarantee you'll learn things about the county's impact on your lives that you didn't know before. Stay tuned. If you heard a few coughs, it's because our guest is getting over a nasal sinus congestion uh, infection, so we're really glad to have <laughs> you. But uh, just to finish out uh, some background information, uh, Santa Clara County has a population of 2 million people versus like San Mateo County to the north with 750,000. And our county is the fifth or sixth largest in the state of California and get this, the 14th largest in the USA. Liz was first elected supervisor in 2000 and has been reelected twice, most recently in 2008. As I said, she just completed a year as president of the board. This was her second stint in that post. She's one of five supervisors and her district, our district, includes all of Palo Alto, Stanford, Mountain View, Sunnyvale, Los Altos, Cupertino, Montessorino, Saratoga, and even part of San Jose. So Liz, welcome to our discussion. And uh, let me start with a couple of background questions that'll bring us all up to speed about what it is the county and you as our supervisor focus on. So you have a $4 billion budget. Where does that money get spent? Well. Two million of it gets spent on what we call million or billion. Two billion, two okay, billion yeah. gets spent on our general fund, and that goes to public safety, public welfare, public justice, public health. So, think of it as all of the publics. And let me clear my throat, Elliot, because, mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> as you said, I've just recovered from sinusitis. That two billion is able to serve our very neediest and our very naughtiest in this county. And so it goes for those things that you may not think about very often. Our medically indigent through our hospital goes in our jails. It goes out to our social service people who are there as well. So what we serve as, I think, is sort of the civility in a county. We're the underpinning for you. We're the safety net, if you will, for for the entire county of, as you mentioned, two million people. So where does that four billion dollars <throat> come from? Where do you get the money? Well, there are two funds that I think it's important for people to know about. One is the two billion that's in the general fund. That money primarily comes from property tax, it comes through the state, it comes through the federal government. The second two billion are special funds that comes through the parks, through the roads and airports, through our library and so forth. So we set that aside because that money comes in on a far more regular basis. The two billion is the money we fight for every year with the state and with the federal government to get. You mean you have to fight for your share of we the fight, property tax? We absolutely fight for our share. So how's the fight with the state been going for the county? Um, the fight with the state, this, we've been losing the fight with the state. When I first took office, we got almost 45% of our $2 billion from the state. We're now getting, as of yesterday, I asked our chief financial officer, we get now about 32%. That's a dramatic drop. We continue to get 21% or so from the federal government. The rest is made up in a variety of other, from a variety of other funds. But with the state, we're losing, and with the state, as we get less money from the state, we're losing services. And, and that's, what, that's what we should be concerned about at the county level is the services because they're so essential 
So um, the, the uh, year that you served as the president of the board was just a yucky economic <laughs> year. I mean, we had the biggest uh, recession at least since 2001, maybe even since the Great Depression. And so uh, what can you point to that was accomplished uh, that, you know, what, what was the big accomplishment of 2009 in that kind of context? Well, th let me point to several things that did happen that I think were good. One of the areas that I've most focused on is public health. And so an area that I began working on, actually, oh, now three years ago, had to do with food. And it had to do with menus and menu labeling and what we spend on that. So we looked at that issue and said, Part of the reason that we're dealing with this incredible obesity problem in our county and in our country is that people don't know exactly what it is they're eating. So at the county level, we introduced a measure that was an ordinance putting the amount, the, the nutritional amount, the calorie count, on a menu, on a menu that would be posted that you could see within, with, within a fast food restaurant. We passed it at the county the state picked it up, and with the help of one of the state senators, it is now a state law. So that as of this July, you're going to see calorie counts going up in fast food restaurants like McDonald's and even Starbucks, Burger King, right? even Starbucks, and you'll be able to tell exactly what's in what you're eating. They must already have that in New York because I was on vacation there and I saw the calorie counts, and it definitely steered my my hands away from uh, what I really wanted. So as, as the public health um, provider, truly for the county, we are the health department. We provide the public health. That's one of the issues I feel best about. But we also do a health care system for the entire county that I think of as, in many ways, universal health care. So anybody in Santa Clara County can get health care. We have clinics. We have partnerships. And as you know, we have Valley Medical Center, which is our huge hospital. And in 2009, no question, you had to look for savings. So how did you approach that? So in 2009, thanks to our unions, and we have 26 unions, we were able to negotiate with them no pay raise. So for two years, there'll be no pay raise, which saves us an enormous amount of money. But we're coming up on 2011. And when we get to that, we will have to renegotiate all of our contracts again. That's going to be a tough time for us. Do you uh, foresee continued uh, savings from uh, wages? Um, we'll see. I, I think that by that time, the unions are going to think that they may have already given at the office. And I, I, I don't think that we will be able to stay with 0%. So I, I have been grateful that we've had this two years of reprieve. And, um, but we'll look ahead to see what happens next. I imagine that uh, the morale takes a hit when you have those kinds it, of concessions. It, it so, does indeed, it does. Uh, if uh, you out there see a uh, county worker, go give them a compliment. And say thanks, <laughs> say right, thanks, exactly. Uh, what is it, like $23 million saved this year alone? Yes, alone. And, and already we're looking at a deficit for next year. So it, it's, it's unnerving because we have done very well as a county. And now, for the first time, we're really looking at a cash flow problem. And as you know, from your business as well as from my business, if your cash flow isn't a continual flow, you really have a problem. So um, we cannot raise our own funds. As I mentioned, we're, we're, we are dependent on the state, the federal government, and some of the other funds that come in through special kinds of taxes, but we cannot as a county raise our own funds. And I think if those watching the program hear anything, hear that the county cannot raise your taxes, we cannot um, alter fees, there's nothing we can do that contributes to our, out, to our, our, our outflow that, that we can spend without um, looking to the state and the federal government. So you don't control revenues, um, but at the same time, you don't control costs going up either, and no. they do go up. No, and they do go up, Now, yes. uh, speaking just about some of the social welfare 
uh, indicators. 2009 was a very difficult year for a lot of people in our county um, at every end of the spectrum. But uh, on, the, and on the social safety net side, um, the statistics I have is that Medi-Cal, the low-cost medical service, mm -hmm. the need went up by 7.5%. CalWORKs, support for job seekers, it went up by 11%. This is the demand for these services. And exactly. food stamps went up almost 28%. So were the funds there to uh, pay for these greater needs of county residents? When, when um, a period of time like this occurs, what we have to do is, is look to our reserves, which we did last year. And that's our social services administration area. And so what they had to do was, they had to make some of their own cuts, but in order to do that, and provide those services you just spoke about, they had to go into their reserves as well. So that it was a very, very challenging year, and a year where many people never anticipated they'd be, they would be jobless, or in many cases, have no place to live. And so uh, where are we with our, our budget after covering these greater needs while funding from the state has decreased? Where does so, that leave us? So as of yesterday morning, when we went through our mid-year budget, for the first time, we actually are looking at a cash flow problem. We haven't looked at this in a number of years. We had excellent reserves left from the 90s. Um, as we recovered in the middle of the 2000s, that, that three, four, five period, we began to set aside a, a substantial amount in reserves. Pretty much that will be gone by the end of this year. We have, um, we faced 2011, I think, in, a, in, in not a good situation, nor is the state. So you've heard the same at the state, and yesterday I was hearing that San Francisco is going to cut 20,000 of their workers back three hours a week. And that's, that changes people's lifestyles. So you want to rebuild the reserves, but you don't see any new monies coming down the Pike. I don't see any new monies coming down the pike. In fact, if anything, we've, we've debated whether we're seeing, whether we're at the bottom of the U, so-called, or whether we're, we're still here on the U and the U is, hasn't bottomed out yet. And what we're hoping is we've hit bottom and we're starting back up. But it takes a long time, Elliot, mm -hmm. to recoup those reserves and have that on hand so that you have that rainy day money. I remember years ago you telling me in an interview, everything comes in cycles. It, <laughs> it comes back and not, but maybe not quick enough. Well, this and cycle has been, I think, astonishingly different. Everyone thought it would hit and then rebound. And Obama went into office, started with the ARA funding. One issue with the ARA funding that might be of interest to your viewers is that a lot of that money is still stuck because it took using the money, actually getting the contract and hiring the people in order to put it in the pipeline. So we have used it and a fair amount of it. We've been very grateful at the county for what we've gotten, but we've reached the end of our RF funds now. We, as, about, as of yesterday, uh, the we- The stimulus money? The stimulus money, right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the American Recovery Act. Oh, okay. So those were the funds. My apologies for yeah. that. Yeah. Do you have an example yeah. of where those funds uh, were spent in our county? Exactly, right, right. They were spent in a variety of ways, some in projects that involved roads and so forth. But a lot of it went into our hospital and into our technology program. And so one of the things we did yesterday was we actually took the end of the ARA money, which was about $40 million, the stimulus money, I should call it that. And that actually is going to fill our mid-year budget problem. We, we call them solutions, but solution really means that you plugged a very big financial hole. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it doesn't sound uh, too comfortable for somebody in your position and then, of course, the rest of us. Um, I'm wondering uh, if uh, we can switch to uh, our focus to Stanford because sure. Stanford's part of, uh, it's really part of your district and uh, it's kind of its own animal. This year was a big year regarding Stanford because right. in order to build all the new buildings that they want to do. They had to agree to public benefits, and there's a study called the GUP. The, well, uh, the, the general use permit was actually passed um, in the late 
le very late 90s. So I inherited the general use permit and all the stipulations that go with it. One of the stipulations was when they reached the end of their first million square feet that they could add, they had to do a sustainability study before they could do the second two million, two million square feet on campus. And that took us a long time last year to get through that, to agree on what allows sustainability, what doesn't impact the community around it to the extent that, um, you know, that one, one would hope it would be mitigated. And so that took us quite a while. That took us almost six months to go through that. And to explain to viewers, Stanford is an unincorporated piece of my part of the district. They have no elected city officials, so we at the county are their only governing body. So when Stanford needs building permits or so forth, they go to the county, not to the city. And people may find that confusing because the hospital itself is in the city. But most of Stanford is in the county. So Stanford it's being isn't uh, it? in yeah. your district, and my there's district. Five, five supervisors. Right. So in a normal situation where uh, there's something in one person's district, the other supervisors probably look to that supervisor for leadership. How does it work with Stanford? Differently. Uh -huh. <laughs> it differently. And I think Stanford and I have a good relationship. However, we have other colleagues who have very close connections with Stanford, including our current president, who got his doctorate at Stanford. So there are many connections that my colleagues feel with Stanford. So when we went through this, there was a good deal of communication with everyone. But you're right. Normally, a land use issue, if it is in someone's district, um, is pretty much guided by the supervisor in that district. But when it gets to big land use issues like Stanford, or in Don Gage's district, which is the one way to the south with Gilroy, lots of open space, ranches, and so forth, the rest of the colleagues weigh in pretty heavily. So tell me how the vote went on what was the vote about and how did it go? Was it a tough one or? Uh, on the sustainability? Mm -hmm. I think in the end it went pretty well. Um, we've made some different stipulations than perhaps Stanford might have liked regarding how it will be done the next time because there is another study that has to be done at the end of the next two million square feet. Because at that point, probably Stanford will come back again for the next general use permit. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine because we think of Stanford already as pretty impacted, as pretty built up. But the next, the, the next supervisor who sits here is going to be the one who talks about whatever the next general use permit is. Well, at some point, uh, there'll be the hills are 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 up for uh, well. Debate, right I now, imagine. they're protected. If yeah. you remember, until 2025. Oh, okay, yes. So we have a long-term protection until then. And let me say on the air, I'm grateful to Stanford for allowing the use of the dish as they do. Probably the most popular de facto park in our entire region. Um, on a Sunday, that place is jammed. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's one of the most beautiful places to go at this time of year. It's green, it's um, you know blooming, it's, it's very pretty. And all those greens and blooms, rec as you realize, end up with um, someone like me getting their sinuses involved in it as well. Now, but it's one uh, of my favorite, my favorite places to walk. Who do you mostly deal with at Stanford about these issues? Usually their land use area either government affairs or the land use area. And so for the sustainability study, we dealt very, um, you know, almost overwhelmingly with their planning department. Uh -huh. And uh, we deal a lot with um, one of the former mayors of Palo Alto, with Jean McCown, as you so, probably and know. And one of your, you sat on the council at the same time. Uh, she was mayor and I was vice mayor. So, so now you're at opposite sides of the table. Well, we Is try not state? to be. We try, we really do try. Jean is one of the best um, at um, negotiating that I know. She's very reasonable, very reasonable and, and rational. Now, she's a pleasure to deal with. Good. Um, another thing that came up, actually even in 2010, is a uh, Supreme Court uh, decision, California State Supreme Court decision, that uh, some of our viewers anyway will remember that part of 
Stanford's public benefits was to provide two trails uh, that people could use for the hiking. The infamous trails, right. And so this, uh, de describe what this Supreme Court case uh, will change. Uh, the first thing it will change is that the South Trail will, will begin almost right away to be constructed. And as far as I understand, it is, it is underway, and I'm guessing that within a matter of months that will be open. That's to the south, close to Page Mill, close to where you know we're used to driving from you know, Pacera across to, to 280. The second trail is still in contention, and that's the one to the north. And Stanford has um, offered Menlo Park eight to ten million dollars if they will construct that trail which runs along Alpine Road. So far Santa Clara, San Mateo County has uh, turned the offer down. If that were to persist, the money will come back to Santa Clara County um, unless something else is negotiated by the end of 2011. What, what would Santa Clara County do with and, what, and about we, we, $9 million? Dollars? It's, it could be 9 or $10 million. Uh -huh. depends on what it is by then. Yeah. But presumably, it will go into our Parks Department and mm -hmm. will be used for open space for, you know, a, a, for parks kinds of needs in our county, so in Santa Clara County. Whereas currently, it's going into San Mateo County, which was a somewhat unusual decision. And speaking of unusual, why did it, why did it become a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court? What was the two sides? The, the two sides were the Committee for Green Foothills maintained that the correct um, land use study had not been done in order to uh, allow that to happen. And however, the, the real crux of the case was whether or not they had filed insufficient time. Finally, the Supreme Court made that decision that the filing, the objection, had not been done within a reasonable length of time. Whose objection? The objection by Committee for Green Foothills. So, that, so, so Stanford always wanted to build the one trail and not and just keep the other one in contention right now? I don't think in contention. I think that Committee for Green Foothills was looking for a very different kind of trail than what people have nicknamed the sidewalk trail that would exist in, in, um, you know, in San Mateo County along Alpine Road. They much preferred something that was more recreational, something that involves Stanford lands. And um, that, that, that's not yet resolved, Elliot, as you know. So uh, to be con that's a tale to be continued. But we will be seeing a new trail in the coming You will year, see maybe. the Southern Trail. No, it, that's without, without question. You will see the Southern Trail. And I would say as within a matter of months. Now, your year as president of the board, uh, you were the only woman on the Board of Supervisors. And I still am, right? And you still are. <laughs> still okay. are. Okay. Right. Um, and just, this is your final term. This so is my final term. Third right. and final term. Right. So right. A, a total of 12 years as our supervisor. Right, right. Um, do you, can you... And 15 years before that in, you know, in oh, city I government know. in Palo Alto. School, so. school board so I've and had city a, council. So I, I've had a great view um, as I've gone from school board to city council, serving twice as mayor in two really interesting times, Centennial and the Millennial, and then going on to be um, supervisor and, and serving twice as president, which is also somewhat unprecedented. Yeah, and as we were setting up for this interview, you explained to us how to mic you, because you've been mic'd a, right. a million times. <laughs> but, um, and we're now webcast, <laughs> Elliot. We've never been right. televised. But we are now webcast. We are webcast, and we also can put little excerpts of this interview on for people to Which check out terrific. later at their right. convenience. Right. But um, uh, I was going to ask about those gender dynamics. It, it's not. It's 2010 now, but still, uh, as the only woman, do you notice that? I do. And just as you probably heard many women's groups fight to have more women in office, and we're seeing fewer women going into office almost everywhere, it changes the conversation because women tend, and I, I don't want to genderize this, but women do tend to look at issues in a different way. They tend to be more family-oriented. Um, you'll notice women tend to migrate more toward the, the health, the human service area. And it's also a different conversation that women have with each other. And when Blanca Alvarado was on the board with me, we had um, you know, a very close relationship. We actually chaired the two major committees together. So that was, um, 
it was a pleasure. And if I can just be funny for a minute, um, guys never look at each other and say, love your hair or great new shoes. <laughs> just doesn't get done. So you need another woman on the board. I'd like but another woman on the board. But it isn't going to this term. Well, it could. Oh, no, yeah. There is and a woman running. Two years. Yes, yes. Oh, so at okay. the end of this year, Don Gage will leave, mm -hmm. and the new member will sit for my last two years. Do you ever find it uh, a disadvantage to be uh, the lone woman uh, on a board with all men? Not well, when usually. When it comes to votes. No, not usually. No. Uh -huh. But I think for that kind of discussion that you might have that tends to be more female oriented, um, you know, I do miss that aspect of it. So um, let, me, let me switch to, because I know you're the vice chair of the housing land use, environment, and transportation committee. Right, right. I'm, so, I am chair of our, of our hospital area, but what we call our health and human services area, which is our hospital and so forth. And then I'm vice chair of the land use committee. And each one of us has a chair committee and a vice chair um, committee that we do as well. Well, I brought up the land use because I was going to ask you, what, what does smart yeah. growth mean to you at the county level? Oh, it's, it's very significant at the county level. We have probably had more discussions about how we will locate houses in the hills than uh, almost anything I can remember. We now have some very strong stipulations about where you can site your house in the hills, what kind of materials you need, and so forth. So we don't have a, a, a size that we put on homes. What we do have is a great deal of what we call site and design review so that we review the colors, we review a number of other things, but particularly, how do you see this house from the valley? How do you see something that, that goes up? So we have seen, um, in, my, in my time on the board, we have actually seen a house come to us that was 22,000 square feet. Wow, basketball that was pretty court and swimming yes, pool. Yes. And but to be truthful, we were far more interested in how it impacted the valley below and their neighbors than we were the size of the house. Um, that house, I don't think, ever got built. I think it was proposed during more robust economic times. Um, and my, to my recollection, it, it did not get built. But it was a, a long discussion at the time. But you have policies you've put in place to give you guidance we on do. those decisions yes. rather than a case-by-case -case, uh, right. lengthy process? Yes, we have policies on a whole variety of things. As I said, not on house size, but we have it on how you site your house and so forth. And now we have a green ordinance as well that determines what kind of materials we you, you will use depending on the size of, of the house as well. So we, um, again, uh, our unincorporated areas tend to be less visible certainly to most people, more to the south than to the north. But um, we, we keep very careful track of what goes up into the hills. So if you cross into the next county, which you know you might if you're driving on 280, you'll notice all of a sudden there are lots of houses up in the hills. But if you're in our county, you'll see that those foothills as you go south tend to be pretty green and attractive. Well, that gives me a question for when we interview your counterpart from San Mateo County, Rose Jacobs Gibson, right, next right. month. Well, so. it's not their county. It's, the, it's Alameda, because oh, you're going okay. to Alameda County. Oh, that's why I said on the 280 side. Oh, OK. I, I, their, um, their policies in San Mateo County, I'm not as familiar with as far as their, their housing limits in their unincorporated areas. And speaking of uh, what's visible to people every day in Palo Alto, um, we'll get back to it, but 280 is one of those uh, roads that you really do take care of as the county. So. Actually, not no. Oh, 280, 280, 280 is no. 280 is a you know a, that's a federal highway, whereas Page Mill is ours though. Page Mill and Oregon are ours, and you recall there was a uh, big discussion last year about what we were going to do with the interchange at Oregon and Middlefield. And we had uh, a number of complaints from the neighbors about how that would be improved. And so our planning department took that to heart, met with the neighbors in that Middlefield, Oregon expressway area. And they've come up with a plan that um, seems comfortable for the neighbors and will make that interchange work far better. And that's thanks to an earmark, thank you, Anna Issue, um, that was more than $3 million.
Well, you, you got pretty deeply involved in that. I imagine that it's not all the time that you are actually sitting down at, at, at the table negotiating with Palo Alto residents on your range of, of concerns. No, no. So here you were. What, were people angry at you as their neighbor and also, uh, or I, how, how did you, it come to a resolution? Yeah. I, I don't, know, I don't were, know if they were angry, but they certainly were concerned. And my staff um, met with not only the planning department in Palo Alto, but also the county, but also met with the neighbors. So there were a series of meetings that took place. And um, we, I think, worked very closely with the neighbors. I hope they weren't angry with us. I hope they felt that we were working um, as closely as we could with them to come up with a, a good solution. Well, it would and it I think dealt we have with done trees, that. which in Palo Alto oh, is yes, a hot button. Yes, as you know. In Palo Alto, we don't mess with our trees. We don't mess. No, so, But no. somehow my understanding is that everybody signed on to the res resolution. They did. To they did. To the final, to the final um, plans that were made. And those should start sometime within the next year. But again, that was an earmark federal money. Nothing came from the state to do that. But that is our road. Page Mill, Foothill Expressway is ours. Um, so whenever you see the word expressway somewhere in the county, it probably is a county road. And then we also have miles and miles of county roads that go up into the unincorporated areas of, of the county. One, one of my big concerns, we frequently get calls saying, the bushes are overhanging the county road. You know, someone needs to come out. And at a recent meeting, um, I was thanked by the people up in Los Altos area for how quickly we responded. So good to and, hear. And good to hear our workers are, are jumping to yes, it. Yes, yes, right. Um, another thing, going back to housing, that we would be aware of in Palo Alto are affordable housing developments. And those tend to be very contentious as well. Um, I think that in a lot of cases, uh, the fact that we can force a developer to provide up to 20%, often 15% of mm -hmm. the new units to be affordable in Palo Alto. Units, right. in Palo right. Alto. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually uh, brings out uh, a lot of upset people because for those 20% you're going to get, or 15%, you're going to get 85% more units. Mm -hmm. So the total impact becomes a very contentious yeah, issue. Yeah. And I was surprised when I found out that um, the county has an additional way or ways to help create affordable housing that might not have that full impact of, of getting mm -hmm. all the other right. units as well. Can you talk a little bit about how the county played a role in the 801 Alma development? Well, we have an affordable housing fund and when someone is going to, um, you know, has applied to, to put that kind of, of uh, you know, multiple units in, into place, they can apply to the county for, for funding. Um, and there are two ways. We have an affordable housing um, fund and department at the county, but also as a result of the general use permit at Stanford, there is a certain amount of money that Stanford must set aside for affordable housing as well. So at this end of the county, in the Palo Alto, Mountain View, and so forth, we have really gotten a, um, a, a very fair share of the money that has been available and has made an enormous difference in the amount of affordable housing that we have put into this part of the county. Um, and I would also say at the same time, it's why it's important um, when I get replaced by whomever may run, when I get replaced that people remember that the county runs from Palo Alto to Gilroy and that it doesn't just encompass one big city, San Jose, but we're a county that has 15 cities in it. Every city has their needs. And small cities sometimes aren't as vocal or as noisy, but the needs are just as, just as clear and obvious, even if it's for a few people than if it's for an enormous number. So uh, I, I always feel very strongly that my job is to really think about my district, as well as the region, but to think about my district and what our needs are, and bring as many of those resources here as I can. Your, uh, well, just to finish about 801, that's an example where the whole, every unit is an affordable unit. 
unusual, uh, by the way, right? Part, in part, anyway, because they were able to get that kind of funding mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than um, have it be a, a commercial developer that's looking to build as many right. units as. Yeah. But, but in terms of what you just said about representing a lot of the smaller cities in the county that may not have the same clout, uh, are there differences between the cities that you represent? Is Palo Alto on one end of the spectrum politically from all the other cities I named at the top of the show that you represent? Well, not, not necessarily. I think Palo Alto probably is the most, um, in many ways, has been the most green of the cities. They've concentrated on that for a very long time. And one of the most techy of the cities. When um, the current mayor gave his speech the other night, Pat Burt, he mentioned that we had started our fiber, our laying our dark fiber, I actually when I was mayor in 94, and which was kind of him to mention that. So we're often way ahead in the technology area, and I think that's something we should be very proud of. But every one of the cities is quite different. So if you look at Palo Alto versus Saratoga, or if you look at Mountain View versus Cupertino, they're all quite different in their makeup. But it's, it's unusual. I'm the only one that represents, essentially, all or part of 10 cities. And, and that's, that's quite different. But we each have to add up to one-fifth of the population in the county. So in order for us to do that, we have to have a number of cities in District 5. And I have all of eight cities, and then I have a, a part of Sunnyvale, I have half of Sunnyvale. And I have another 50,000 people in San Jose bigger than, um, you know, many of my cities. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's... Um, Which is interesting. You're, you're kind of tracking situations in all of these cities, I assume? All of the cities. I, I try to make sure I'm in all of my cities, certainly once a month, but usually far more than that. And um, I know that when I turn up for things, they always say, you always seem to come to our events, or you always seem to be wherever. So some nights I do do three events, and some nights I'm in three different cities to do those events. So you don't I, have I take the it clones out there. <laughs> no, uh, but I take my representation very seriously. So I have a good relationship with the county, with the councils in each of each of those city council and each of those cities, and we try to be really responsive because each one has different needs. And it's really important that we understand what those are. So on my staff, somebody on my staff has every city that's assigned to them. So you might be a staff member with two cities, or you might just have one city. But um, that's your city, and you're responsible for letting me know what's going on in that city and what their problems may be, and how can I help and deal with it. So I'm, I'm going to switch again, because uh, you We're ready. mentioned uh, earlier that uh, your personal interests or, or expertise is in the health area. Right. And I know this year you actually, you know, this was a huge year for uh, the debate on our health care system, which uh, I'd love to hear your assessment of it. But, uh, but in particular, I know that you got involved in that national debate. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. went to Washington, D.C. Can you connect the dots of where the county uh, intersects with sure. the federal programs? Mm -hmm. So, because I have a public health background, um, when I first got on the, the board, that was one of my first interests. So from, oh, I think the second or third year I chaired our, our health committee. So that led to my being very involved at the state level. So I now also chair the health committee for the state as well, our, for our county organization at the state level. And then I became very involved with our health care at the federal level. And last summer, I was named co-chair of the Health Reform Committee for our national organization, which was quite an honor. I was absolutely delighted. So we have. I was back and forth to Washington a lot in the fall. And um, I thought counties were really making a difference. And then, as you know, we had the, um, the amazing Scott Brown election. And suddenly, everything has gone in a different direction. I'll leave this Friday to be back in D.C. again, and um, I, I hope I'm going to finally see where this is going. And um, we're going to meet with Wendell Primus, who is Nancy Pelosi's chief health aide. So I'm um, 
very excited about meeting with him. And uh, when I get back, I wish I could tell you now what's going to happen, but maybe I'll have a, a much better view of it. What version are you hoping for? Uh, what would make the most difference to county residents? The most, the most difference to county residents would actually be if we could get our federal funding to come directly to counties rather than going through the state. We, we could make a big difference that way. But there are a whole variety of other things that I think would make a big difference. And one of them is if we could um, look at how we provide health care differently in such a way, especially that we don't have to look at um, taking on risky patients as being such a risk. And as you know, that's uh, certainly a, a big part of what we've been concerned about. And we just began a new county program, which you might know about, called Healthy Workers, that we started on Monday, that is our, our own county health care reform. And we're going to see how that plays out, because that allows workers who make under $18 an hour an opportunity to opt into a new health care provision that's going to be called Healthy Workers. Well, and we, aren't we one of the leading uh, counties when it comes to uh, extending insurance to children? Uh, we, we, thank you. We, we had the first family health plan and the first children's initiative. And that is one that began here and has pretty much been picked up across the state to include children. And that's done through what we call Medi-Cal here, but which is really Medicaid, which is a, which is a federal program. And, and it's, it's survived, one of the ones we uh, feel. Even with these budget cuts. Well, it hasn't survived as well as it might have, but um, let me give a plug for Kaiser that has picked up a lot of the kids that wouldn't have been covered otherwise. Uh, because as the funding fell, we, we did look for other sources. Um, El Camino has stepped up in that, in that regard as well. So we've been fortunate that way. So these. They're actually putting in some of the money that it takes Kaiser or some actually, of the services that it takes. Yeah, Kaiser actually has picked up some of the kids right. and given them the care at their own, you know, in their own setting so that we have not had to provide it all. And that's been a very good partnership, and I, I commend them for doing that. Do you have a sense of how many uninsured people there are in our county and how this health care reform, if oh, Obama and the, uh, if it happens. Right. So I'll, I'll tell you the two-part prong to this, which is um, somewhat controversial, but we figure between 40 and 50,000 people are uninsured. And this would certainly go a long way toward insuring them. But the second part, Elliot, that we don't want to deal with is, is really that elephant in the room. It's our undocumented who live in our county and whom I think deserve health care, not only for their sake, but for your sake. Because we don't want people who have active PB, TB not being treated. I don't want anyone who even has the sinus problem I've recently had being untreated. And I, I think when we're a healthy community, including all our residents, whether they're documented or not, we are far better off. And that's controversial because you've heard the president say there will be no undocumented included in a health plan, and, and that does trouble me. That will cut our funding from the federal government down um, pretty substantially. That's a big concern to me. And uh, the other one, we'll come back to immigration, because that does raise um, questions in my mind, since there right. are so right. many in our county. But mm -hmm. um, And we don't know how many. So when, I, when I've been back meeting in Washington, one of the things that um, Diane Feinstein's office asked me for was, how much do you spend on undocumented health care? And we could only come up with a rough figure um, and nothing precise. But uh, also the pre-existing conditions must have uh, an impact uh, when, when people can't get coverage. Right. Is that, are you aware of that in our county? That well, I'm aware that insurance companies, you know, certainly whether it's our county or anywhere, certainly um, uh, they don't want anyone with a pre-existing condition. But as you probably know, the insurance companies um, look for ways to deny regardless. And, and we fight with that at our, our level at Valley Medical Center as well. So uh, again, uh, the funding for health in the county. 
uh, we, know we spend about one point six billion dollars in our county. The largest. On the largest, or is prisons larger than that? Is that well? Because we have jails, not prisons. Uh -huh. Prisons, prisons are another story. That's the state, um, you know, penal system. But we run the jails. We spend certainly more on health care than we do on jails in our county, and I'm delighted to tell you that. I'm glad to hear yes, that. Yes, yes, yeah, right. But within that budget, um, I imagine the overwhelming percent of that is going to our county hospital. Um, it does. Where, That's where right. else would a Palo Alto resident see health, health money oh, from the such county? Such a great question. One of the things that I think a lot of people don't know is how many people we partner with, with Mayview. We, we partner with Planned Parenthood, which is right at the corner um, in Mountain View, you know, at, at San Antonio. Um, but also Fair Oaks, which is in Sunnyvale, is a county clinic which is quite reachable by people who are from here by, by bus. It's right, right on the bus route. So we have clinics in our county that we run solely. We have a number that we partner with, Planned Parenthood, Gardner Healthcare, and so forth. So there are many ways that our healthcare dollar is spread in the county. But you're right, a great deal of it goes in, into the actual hospital and into, into healthcare. Is that, that one setting. of those areas where you have to stand up to the other four supervisors and say, here's the less vocal areas of the county and we need clinics or nurses? Or it is. Yes, exactly. We, we, we have fought hard for our Fair Oaks. And Fair Oaks, by the way, also had a major contribution from El Camino. And so that's our northernmost clinic. And it's an excellent clinic with with psych care and obstetrics and um, and dental, so we even we even have dental rooms. See. So did all did the hospital plus all the clinics go through cutbacks from the county this year or in the past year, or it's, is the hospital doing better? Or how how is that all playing it's, out? It's one of the areas where we've stayed fairly stable, but we now have a new county executive who's Dr. Jeffrey Smith. And so we're, we're going through some, some reorganization right now in our healthcare system because we are so concerned about where we're heading long term with both our federal dollars, but more, more importantly with our state dollars. And also, I'll, I won't go into this extensively, but there's something called um, a Medicare waiver Medi that, that involves us working with the federal government that goes through the state so that we can get a, a sufficient match in our county hospitals to provide better care with the federal dollar. So uh, going back to immigration, um, Always is, a is tough health topic. Uh, the only area that the county looks at immigration and its impact, or are there other ways that um, you, you, you deal with it's, that? It's a good question. Depending, actually, on who's in office at the federal level, it will depend on what our responsibilities are in another area, which is our jails. So in the past, um, looking back two or three years, where there were frequently raids and to discover undocumented workers, we actually had many of those people in our jail. That has been far more lenient lately, and when I was asking last week, I was actually doing a jail tour. Um, right now, we have probably 40 or 50 who, you know, they uh, would look to um, send back to their, their own country. But we, we have seen far, far less activity in that area lately. But do you remember for a while, you'd hear about the ice raids and yeah. what was happening there? Mm -hmm. And that's a federal, uh, really a federal issue. Um, so in the our county, county has no way to say to ICE, uh, cut back on these raids, or we, they're not productive? No. Or this, this is a real pecking order, as you know. Federal first, and then the state, and um, the county is at, at another level. Uh huh. So uh, the, I, I, I've just become a uh, volunteer English teacher at the Day Workers Center a few months back. Oh, so thank I've you. I've been really thank enjoying you. that. And I've worked with them very closely, and um, that's that's an amazing process that they, they have gone through. The um, recently in the news was the 2010 uh, Silicon Valley Index that was that's put together annually by 
Joint Venture Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, right, which exactly. you were on their board. I'm for, still on their board. I was, I was their, I was their co-chair for three years. And and also from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, the two put their heads right. together with a lot of staff, and yes. and they figure out a lot of statistics yeah. that I don't know if we'll have time to get into. But the overall message was economically we're stalled. And uh, economically, the message was bleak. So Doug Kenton, who presents that each year was far less um, up, far less encouraging than he has been in the past. Because as you remember, we talked about where are we in this U or whatever it may be. And we don't know where we are. We would love to think we bottomed out at this point. But I recently heard someone say that as far as meeting the, the jobs rate and so forth, unemployment, that they don't anticipate that when people start filling uh, jobs again, that, that we'll see a big change in the unemployment rate because many people have been working part-time and they will hope to go back up to 40 hours a week rather than staying part-time. So this kind of brings us full circle to this almost catch-22 that you as a county executive face where uh, you're looking for the money to rebuild, You're, you've just gotten down to spend the, you've spent mm -hmm. the reserves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're but at a point Not our where contingency reserves, just so I can reassure people, we still keep 5% in contingency reserves, but we keep a number of other funds, and those are the funds that we have been depleting. And it sounded like uh, you spent the, the surplus that had come in in the rich years, or the, the good years. We did. And oh, that, we have. That's we will. Gone. So... <laughs> Um, and do we need a turnaround in the Silicon Valley's economic engine to, to really rebuild any reserves like we had? It, it, will, it will take that, yes. There's, there's really no other way for us to be able to accumulate again because it, it, you know, as I've explained, it's always hard to believe, but we as a county simply don't have the ability to tax you more or to, you know, have other ways to pull more money. We, we instead, um, you know, as I mentioned, we're so, so much at the mercy of the state and the federal government that we um, hopefully will be pleading our case. I'll be pleading our case next Tuesday. I'll be, uh, as we say, on the Hill visiting our representatives back in Washington. And we will look, hopefully, for what are called earmarks, um, you know, sometimes referred to as pork on, on uh, I, I think unfavorably, but I do think it's important that um, we go back, that we plead our case, and we have several areas where we're going to be asking for money. Can you give an example? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one that I think we'll find very interesting. We are going to look for funding for Page Mill, and where Page Mill meets 280, where there's such a, a dangerous corner, where there have been many bike accidents and where there have been some deaths. When you're turning on to Page Mill yes, from, right. from 280 after you right. got the exit. Yeah, if you remember how uh -huh. confusing it is in there, and that needs to really be re revamped, redone. And so we'll, I'll be pleading my case back there. And um, in, in this case, either Representative um, Honda or Lofgren will do that, uh, hopefully will plead that for us. We're also going to be looking for some new mammography equipment that we need at the hospital. And I'll be meeting with Anna Eshoo, um, hoping, hoping we might get that earmark in for next year. How about in the uh, May, Mayview Clinic? Yes, and yes, and because we have had a traveling mammography um, machine, and we need to, um, we, we need to replace that. So um, uh, we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you how you feel about press coverage of county issues. And... If you, uh, if you were an editor of one of the papers, in addition, uh, we don't have that in this right. country, yeah. but <laughs> what kind of articles would you like to see more, uh, more out in the public awareness? Well, what I'd really like is to have people more aware of what the county does do. And um, as you mentioned, and I've mentioned before, we do take care of a segment of the population that's not as visible. And I've, I, Perhaps it's a bit flip, but I think it gives you a sense in a, in a moment that we take care of the neediest and we do take care of the naughtiest.
and we take care of the neediest through our health department and through our clinics and also through our social service agency, food stamps, um, you know, retraining people for work, the workforce and so forth. And then the naughtiest in our jails, but what we hope in our jails is that we provide programs also that allow for rehabilitation. So we have a minimum security at Elmwood and Milpitas. We have the main jail, which is in downtown San Jose, and then we have our probation areas, which are the ranches for, for kids where we hope to rehab kids and keep them from, um, you know, ho hopefully change their lives into a more productive um, outcome for them. Lastly, I want to bring up um, a, a difficult subject, which is the uh, cluster of suicides we've had amongst teenagers in Palo Alto, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all at the meadow crossing of the, of the train, right. the Caltrain. And I know that you've started a committee along with Vic Ojekian, a right. former mayor right. as well, who also suffered mm -hmm. uh, the death, suicide of, of right. his son. And so what are we looking at in, just briefly, in the coming weeks as the work of that committee? So that committee is in the midst of a 12-part meeting um, series. And we are we're about halfway through now. We'll be doing a presentation to the public in April. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have the exact date, but um, watch for that date. And we'll be doing a public presentation at that time. Uh, I think that Vic is doing a terrific job. It's one of the, it's an area that I pushed last year when I uh, was concerned about it. During our June budget period, I asked Nancy Pena, who's head of our mental health department, to set funding aside for that so that we could have the suicide prevention committee meet and um, hopefully come up with some answers and maybe a long-term plan for how we deal with it. Um, part of the issue, I think, is we're afraid to talk about it, um, and we don't know how to talk about it, and we're, we're, we're getting to that, that, I think, discussion of how should we deal or not deal with it. Will there be public meetings leading up to the public presentation? The that meetings right now are public. The meetings so there are, are some meetings people can look right for. Right now, right now. They, they're they're held the in Campbell, and they're held um, every other Wednesday. And, and anyone who wants to know more about it can uh, either go to my website or you can call uh, my office, which is 408-299-5050, 5050, -5050 okay. for District 5. We should have put that five. up on the. Right. Uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for spending this time with us. Uh, uh -huh. We. There's a lot of county stories that just don't see the light of day uh, the way they should because they really do impact us do. as a region. Mm -hmm. And whether it's uh, people on any end of the economic mm -hmm. spectrum, we all are in this together and, and we heal each other's lives. So, so thanks for doing your work. Thanks, well, thanks for sharing for, your information. Thank you for asking me to do this. and. Um, you know, to talk a little about my president's year, but especially to talk about the county and what I think we do, which is such important work. Well, I hope we don't see the end of your public life at the end of your last uh, term as supervisor. Well, I hope not. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get back to that. Thank you okay. from the Mid-Peninsula Community Media Center. Uh, join us again for other interviews with local leaders.